Hey everybody, and this is uh, Stephen, Tech Director for the Historic Morton Theater here in Athens, Georgia. Coming back to you with another episode of Green Room at the Morton. Uh, today we're with Katie Chabers. She is a professional stage manager among other talents that she brings to the theatrical entertainment world. So we're gonna have a conversation with her and learn a little bit more about her background. And if you're interested in being a stage manager, you might wanna pay attention to this conversation. Hi. Hey, how's here. it going, Katie? <laughs> Good. Nice to meet you. Um, we were talking a little bit off camera um, about your connection to the Morton Theater. So why don't we just, we'll start there. You yeah. can tell us a little bit about how, how you're connected to the Morton. Absolutely. Uh, when I was a student at University of Georgia in the theater department, working here at the Morton was my part-time job during college. And I worked here part-time in the box office. I worked as a house front of house manager. I worked as a stage manager for the kind of events that you all have here. And I'll just sort of a little bit of technical overhire, whatever was needed. And it was a really great part-time job and a good way to learn a lot of stuff while I was in school. If you could like briefly describe what a house manager does, you mentioned a lot of different phrases there, overhire, <laughs> front of house, <laughs> For our audience, can you kind of just share a little bit about that and then transition us to where, like you said, your wheelhouse is working with people and specifically maybe not on the patron side, but more on the talent side of things? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so front of house would involve anything that is what a patron would encounter before they come into the theater. So okay. when they, the actual theater performance space. So gotcha. when they arrive at the venue, anyone who is there to greet them, to help them with tickets, to help them with concessions, that just that experience from the moment that they arrive is all encompassed in what we would call front of house, um, which is some of what I did here. And then while I was working with the college theater department, I was stage managing as opposed to house managing. They're kind of two sides of the coin of okay. the patron experience. Um, but a stage manager stays with the production and the performers. And so they're responsible for what is actually happening on the stage as opposed to in front of it. And that is where I landed in my professional career is stage managing and being responsible for all of those logistics and communication for an actual production and the cast and the performers and the musicians and all of those things as opposed to the patrons and more of the work that I was doing here. And I work closely with house managers in my job. Usually you're connected via a radio or a walkie talkie mm -hmm. so that those two sides of the performance uh, can talk to each other and communicate with each other. So talk to me a little bit about, like, you said that's in your wheelhouse, but how did you discover that was in your wheelhouse? How did, you know, you worked other positions within a the theater, like, was there kind of an aha moment or um, was there someone who helped encourage you into that mm -hmm. role or were you just sort of uh, thrust into that position out of necessity? Kind of, what, what's your story? How did you get to be a stage manager? Yeah, well, I actually have been working in technical theater since I was in high school. Um, in sort of middle school, early high school, I started getting involved in kind of the high school theater drama club okay. purely because I had friends that were interested in it. You know, it just seemed like a fun after school activity. And I quickly realized that it. I really liked the environment. I really liked the collaboration and the process. I didn't really love being on stage or performing. Um, and it, this is very strange for me to be under the lights <laughs> instead of, you know, behind too. the scenes somewhere. Yeah. Um, but even in high school, it quickly became apparent that there's always a need for extra hands mm -hmm. backstage in the technical booth. Um, and so that was quickly appealing to me that I could be around all of the theater drama club social life and I could be a part of the process of making a show, but I didn't have to be on stage performing because that never felt like my my jam. Um, so I, I was working on sort of backstage crew, like you said, doing scene shifts and organizing how all of the scenery items are going to get on and off of stage quickly and smoothly and safely. I was working 
on a light board, helping to run lights for like dance performances and things like that already when I was in high school. Nice. Um, and already really loved it. But I, like a lot of people, I think I wasn't sure that it could be a sustainable career. And so that was a decision that I made while I was at UGA that I really wanted to pursue it professionally. And I thought that I could make a career out of it. Wait, you can make money doing theater? <laughs> I mean, amazing. I won't <laughs> say a lot of money, but I will say that theater has been my full-time job um, and has paid my bills and paid my rent. And I'm very lucky and unusual that, like I said, even when I was in school, my part-time job for spending money was working here in a theater. Um, and I have been able to make a career in doing that. So um, You mentioned schooling, um, and we all have a different path into our career. Yeah. Tell me a little bit about, you know, how'd you make that decision to actually go, okay, I think I can make a go of this. And there's always that parental factor as yes. well, like convincing them that like, oh, you can actually, you know, do this as more as a job and not just a hobby. In my case, it was almost the other way around. I sort of had the mentality of, oh, the arts can't be my job. It's just something that I love. And I came to Georgia just because it's a good school. I didn't choose it because I knew that I was going to study theater. Okay. Um, and I was assuming I would be some kind of liberal arts major, history, English, something like that. And um, I was a sophomore and I had already become like begun working in the theater department. I had already volunteered to be the assistant stage manager on a performance, was already spending time in the theater department, but not thinking that I was going to declare a major. And it was kind of my parents who said, you know, this is clearly what you want to spend your time doing. I was in the honors college, and so I had opportunities to be working as sort of research assistants with professors and doing other things. And my parents sort of said, you know, you're choosing to spend your time after classes in a theater until all hours of the night, you know, working really hard on these productions. You're not choosing to go be a history research assistant. So why do you think you want to be a history major? Mm. Um, which I mean, and I did love those classes and I was interested in those subjects, but they were totally correct that where I was truly investing my time and my energy was always in the theater. And they said, we think that you should pursue what you're really passionate about because that's where you're going to be the most successful. So they were actually very supportive and encouraging and that helped me make the decision of, okay, I can really do this as a career, not a hobby. That's awesome. Yeah. I know um, there were some moments like I, I can relate to, like I, I went in as an undeclared music major at Georgia state and really was focused on songwriting and kind of stumbled into AV as a means to an end mm -hmm. and then got lost in AV and I've loved it ever since. So it's really cool to see that you have that support system and it's neat. I think the, the takeaway from that part of your story is that other people um, that are around you noticed the affinity that you had based off the amount of time that you were spending in that um, pursuit and they were the ones who encouraged you to take it further. Yeah. And I think you have to trust the momentum of what you want to put your energy into. Because mm. no matter what you are doing, it's going to be hard work. Right. And it's what is the area in your life where the hard work feels like something you want to do and is manageable. Trust the momentum. That's a beautiful <laughs> phrase. That's awesome. Talk to me a little bit about what are those typical responsibilities that the stage manager has, like, maybe in the pre-planning or rehearsals of the show and then, you know, how that shifts uh, during the show and then after the show, um, what you're responsible for, kind of the pack up, clean up, that kind of thing. Yeah, absolutely. That actually kind of lends itself to one of my favorite facts and aspects of the job is that a stage manager is the only person on a whole production or creative team that stays with a show from the pre-planning phase all the way through closing night and strike. 
And even some theater people don't really think about that, that, that you're the sole member of a team who's there Connecting for that thread. entire process. And I really love that. And I really love guiding a project through all of those stages. Um, I think the most helpful metaphor about a stage manager is that you're kind of like the spoke at the center of the wheel because your biggest job and responsibility is to facilitate communication and logistics so that every outshoot, every department, every separate area has the information that they need, the time that they need, the resources that they need to do their jobs well. Mm. Um, and in professional theater, the other person who has a very similar job to that is called a production manager. Um, and they are responsible for the logistics and the resources and the communication for all of the technical departments. Like they would collaborate more closely with designers and technicians. And then a stage manager is working more closely with the actors and the director and the cast and is actually in the room every day of rehearsals. And the production manager is working more closely with the technical director and is maybe in the room every day of the scenic build and the light hang and those things that yeah. I wouldn't be as hands-on. Um, but that's a person that you would work with really closely. Um, so my production process starts with pre-production planning and meetings with the director and a choreographer or music director if they are involved. And I usually am taking notes for all of those kind of meetings, even if they're having sort of just casual brainstorming meetings. Mm -hmm. The stage manager is responsible for making sure that all of that information gets synthesized so that if someone says in a meeting, you know, oh, I want to do this particular kind of dance for this song, which is going to have this specific restriction on the kind of skirts that they could wear for this dance because they're going to have to do backflips. The stage manager is the person who sits in the meeting and makes sure that then the costume designer and the casting associate and all of those people get that information of, okay, we need this kind of costumes and we need a couple of dancers who can do backflips. And everyone else on the team is talking to each other, of course, right. but the stage manager is sort of the final responsibility of communicating all of that information and making sure that it can all get synthesized into one cohesive product that matches what the director's vision and thought is. Like there it's their responsibility to have that creative vision and those ideas. And then it's my responsibility to make sure that we can actually execute all of that. So you the you capture it, communicate it. You're very much that linking point yeah. between all these different uh departments. I can see why you chose the metaphor of a hub and the <laughs> yeah. spokes of the wheel. Yeah. Um I think in the corporate world, like a project manager would be a very similar job. Absolutely. Because Which is very funny because that's actually what my dad does okay. <laughs> for a technology company. So he always jokes that, you know, our jobs are very similar. He just makes a lot more money. <laughs> <laughs> well, but you have more fun. Absolutely. I have more fun. Absolutely. <laughs> I think I'd like to know a little bit more about um, the myths or uh, common, common misconceptions or misunderstandings about what it is that a stage manager does. You quipped a little bit before we got started that it took a, a solid decade maybe to explain to um, your family and friends exactly what it is you do. Yeah. Um, so tell me a little bit about that. How have you overcome, what are some of those myths and how have you overcome those myths? I think a big misunderstanding or lack of understanding about what a stage manager does comes from the shift between pre-production and rehearsals to performance. Because all of the things that I was talking about before about you're just responsible for communication and record keeping and project management, that is all happening during pre-production. And mm -hmm. then there is a big shift when a show actually goes into tech and opens and going into tech is just the phrase for um, 
when you add all of the technical elements of a show to rehearsal. So it's the, when the actors start using their costumes, when you start using all of the lighting effects and the mm. finalized scenery. Um, and it's usually when you first move to stage from a rehearsal hall or a separate rehearsal space and you start just putting all of the design elements together with the work that the actors have done in rehearsal. And when you get into that phase of a production, the stage manager goes from information manager to actual manager of the performance as it's happening. And so the mm. stage manager is the person who is on the headset calling the cues for the production to all of the different departments, sound, lights, follow spotlights, backstage run crew who's moving set pieces, fly rail who's flying in and out scenery or lighting instruments. Sometimes you also have, you know, dressers for the costume department on your headset channel as well if they have to do really quick costume changes for an actor. And you have assistant stage managers and you have crew chiefs and you have different levels of command to help organize all of that activity because it can quickly become, you know, 65, 70 people wow. involved in running a production because you also would have an orchestra with a music director and a conductor and all of those different areas. And the stage manager is the person who is sort of communication command for all of that. Um, and so that becomes almost a different skill set to execute the in the moment communication differently than the kind of communication it takes to prepare and send emails and keep paperwork and spreadsheets up to date right. beforehand. Um, and that was a funny thing when I was first beginning to stage manage that my parents didn't understand that the director, although they have created all of this and made all of the choices, they then move on to their next project. Directors usually are not with a production past opening night. They might come back occasionally check in, give notes, see how it's going. But a lot of professional directors are very busy and have busy careers of their own where they're balancing multiple projects at once or overlapping projects. And so once a director, the show is open and a director moves on, the stage manager is the person who is executing that vision every night and also maintaining it and working closely with the creative side of a production to make sure that it's staying exactly how the director wants. And when I first started working on shows in college and my parents would come see a show that I was stage managing, I would sort of be like, okay, I have to go start the show now. And they would be like, well, where's the grown up that you need to check in? You know, who's in charge here? Um, where's the grown up? That's great. And the answer, you know, surprisingly was, well, me. Um, and that I think is something that people don't realize that in a pro professional production, and I've only worked in regional theaters where we're running a show for sort of maximum 80 to 100 performances. Um, I, I don't have any experience working on Broadway or commercial theater where they're running a show for years, decades sometimes. Um, but even maintaining a performance over 80 or 100 shows is a skill set that is separate from that kind of logistical communication at the beginning of a process. I think you tapped into something right there. It's I really want to kind of draw that out. Is there's a shift of of control. It's almost like pilot and co-pilot. Absolutely. And that pilot has been the director. You've been very much in that co-pilot um, seat all the way up until the beginning of the show. And like you said, whereas most of us would go, oh, well, the director, director's in charge. Yeah. No, very much the stage manager is, um, I go, I'm going to go to a, a state, a sports metaphor. Uh -huh. You're a point guard, right? Yeah. And so the ball or your quarterback, you're, the ball's in your hands and nothing happens on a show night without the stage manager's approval decision. You're calling yeah. the shots. Like you said, you're the steward of the vision at that point. Um, the director has moved on, uh, everybody has had their input, and you are very much the puppeteer holding the strings. <laughs> and it's, I mean, it's just out of necessity. I mean, that sounds so sort of like dictatorial to be like, <laughs> nothing happens without my say-so. But in reality, it is 
for safety of everyone to have someone whose job it is, is to have their eyes on all departments so that, you know, a stage manager knows that if a scenery piece is about to move, they know the path that it's moving into and they can see if something is in the way and they have the authority to say, stop, do not move. You know, that's all of those things are for people's safety so that you have one person who can see all of the pieces moving and make sure that they move together. Big picture. Yeah. Yeah. It's not that that you're a megalomaniac and you just (laughs) want to control everything. Um, But yeah, very much safety is your concern, especially show night. Like so much of of what we do happens in the dark. Yeah. Literally the dark. And so um, you're, you have to have those eyes in the back of your head Mm -hmm. uh, to make sure that people are safe all night, every night. A good infrared blackout camera on the stage helps too. (laughs) Gotcha. Never thought about that. Um, Well, it sounds like you've done so much as a stage manager and it sounds like that it's a very challenging and demanding job, especially once you make that shift from pre-production to you're in the middle of the production. Mm -hmm. I'm sure that uh, there have been a lot of challenges that you've overcome. Talk to me a little bit if there's one that one particularly that stands out or just a, a genre of problem that seems to reoccur. Yeah. Um, how did you, you know, what was the challenge? How did you solve it? What did you learn in, in that process? Something that was really challenging for me earlier in my career um, it, that turned into a big positive was – the idea of understudies and understudies are hard in small and regional professional theaters because there's always budget restrictions. It's always challenging to have enough people sort of standing by for emergencies. Um, And a lot of theaters don't always do it. They sometimes cross their fingers and hope that they can get by with no emergencies and the thing that really pushed the theater that I worked for forward into using understudies even more, they always had been pretty good about it, I think, even before I started working there, but the booming film and television market in Atlanta for actors really changed the way that we used understudies because these theater actors would, at very last minute, get a call for sort of a one-day commercial shoot that was going to make them more money than a theater could offer them for a whole show. And they're, you know, we want these actors to be really successful and make a living and stay in Atlanta and not move to New York or Los Angeles so that we can have a great art scene here. Um, so of course we're supportive of them doing that, but it really made us create a more robust understudy strategy. Mm-hmm. And we were able to use a lot more young and emerging actors fresh out of college. That's a great way for them to get involved in professional theater. But it also took a lot of learning on my behalf to realize how to communicate all of the necessary information to understudies, how to plan for every possible combination of events that could happen because often you'll have what's called a swing or someone who's understudying multiple roles or multiple areas. And so, you know, you end up having sort of like a draft or a, um, you know, flow chart of, you know, if this person gets sick, then this person goes here, which means that then this person goes here and it, um, change of positions at the last minute. Absolutely. Planet. And it is something that's very common in theater, but it was learning to do it at our size and our scale. Um, that I feel like was an area that I really grew in as a professional stage manager, and it became something that was sort of a specialty of mine. Of prepare- I was always the sort of little bird on the shoulder of the director or the choreographer going, okay, you just created that moment. Now who is, who's going to cover for it? What's the plan B? And sort of always making sure that by the time we got to opening night, we had a really solid plan and the understudies had the information that they needed and 
um, that we were just ready to go at a moment's notice if anything happened. And I had a really great example actually in January of this year. Um, we were doing a performance and there was a massive car fire accident on um, Interstate 85 and about half of our cast was running late or unable to get to the theater and it was a cast of about 12 and almost all of them got stuck in it but then we ended up having to start the performance down three actors um, out of 12 and the understudies, I mean, they got maybe 30 minutes notice that they were going in. Um, wow. Yeah, it was really an event of I was making the phone calls that were like, drive to the theater right now. We'll put you in your costume and we'll push you on stage. And they were all young actors and they all were incredible. And um, our lead actor actually arrived during act one and we swapped him back in at intermission. We had kind of announced to the audience in the curtain speech what had happened and that they were going to be seeing understudies and that as soon as the primary actors arrived, we would put them back in, which is unusual, but so is it being such a late last minute um, swing right. in. And then both of those actors came out and like bowed together at curtain call. And it ended up being this really cool experience that the audience was excited to see. But there's no way that we could have done that without the preparation and the rehearsals for those understudies beforehand. Um, and it was a show with a lot of like fight choreography and like choreographed movement. And I had made sure throughout the process that those understudies had had time in rehearsals to practice that movement, to work with the movement coach, to work with the fight choreographer. They had all done full understudy run-throughs the week that we opened. And so all of that preparation, that hard work that they had done made them available to jump in like that at a moment's notice. But that was definitely something that when I first started working professionally, I wasn't thinking in those terms and I wasn't prepared for an event like that. And if it had happened, it might have canceled the show Right. When I was a younger stage manager. That's really fascinating. I guess I never knew that, you know, a stage manager really takes so much of that responsibility on their back to make sure that that happens. And um, it sounds like that understudying is a real opportunity for young performers to be able to get a leg into yeah. the industry. I think it is. I think it's a really great way to learn. I think it's a really great way. To, it's hard. It's a hard job because you don't get the many, many hours of practice and like getting it in your muscle memory that the primary cast does. You get a lot of observation time and then you get a few full rehearsals and then you have to be ready to go. So it's very challenging. And understudy shows are some of my favorite because I have almost without fail seen the understudies rise to the occasion. And it's such a cool thing to see because it is, it's a hard job, especially if you're a swing and you're learning multiple roles, sometimes in conversation with, you know, you're covering both halves <laughs> of a conversation. That's crazy. And you have to be prepared to jump into one or the other. Um, in a musical, you can be understudying people who are singing different parts of the same harmony, and you have to remember which part of the harmony oh, you're in for confusing. that day. Um, so I certainly couldn't do it, and I'm very impressed by the actors that can, but it's a cool thing to help facilitate. Yeah, absolutely. Versatility. Yes. <laughs> wow. I can only imagine what it would be like to get a call 30 minutes you know, and then you have to just step yeah. in and, and get it done. It was an afternoon matinee and bless him. Our lead understudy worked early morning shifts at a coffee shop. So I called him at about 1 p.m. for a 2 p.m. performance. And he had just gotten home from work and was about to go to bed. And we were like, oh, wow. nope, you got to go. And this is a character that never leaves the stage. I mean, he went on for the top of the act and he didn't come back off until intermission so he had no safety net and he did incredible wow just have to summon it from deep, absolutely deep from within absolutely that's amazing um hats off to people who can do that i mean i agree um 
What advice would you give to somebody who's looking to get into um, professional theater, specifically in, in the role where you serve as a stage manager? Yeah. Um, are there specific steps they should start to take? What's some things they can do to, to kind of begin to prep? Even um, I'm thinking like you, you know, early as a middle schooler, high schooler, mm -hmm. and then maybe beyond, maybe you're in college or or, or uh, chose to go a career path, but you still have this bug for the theater um, and you know you have this knack, you know, what, what can they do to begin to really move themselves towards that career? Yeah. I think the biggest thing is just get in the room as much as you can. And while you have the flexibility, like maybe you're in high school or in college and you don't have to treat it as a job, you don't have to pay your rent, um, or maybe you do, but you have another job, um, using the time where you have the flexibility to maybe volunteer your time to just get in as many rooms as possible is extremely helpful. There is sort of, as we've talked about a couple of times, kind of a lingo to the theater world mm -hmm. as there is probably of most professions. And so you can absorb a lot that's maybe not connected to your specific job just by being in the room. It really helps me as a stage manager to have some understanding of how every department works right. because I have to be responsible with communicating with them and making sure that they're on track and that they have what they need. And so if I don't fully understand what they're doing or what they're trying to accomplish or why something is a problem or could be a problem, then that hinders my effectiveness. So understanding how a set is being built and which parts they're going to build first helps me know what information I have to get to them as soon as possible to minimize changes. Mm. Because in a production, everything is sort of being created at the same time. They're building the scenery at the same time as we're learning the dance that's going to be performed on that scenery. And so it's possible that changes will arise and kind of the goal is to minimize ever having to go back and do redo something that you've already done. So mm -hmm. understanding what the scenic department, what the costume department, what the lighting department, what the sound department are all working on really, really helps. So I think even if it doesn't seem directly related as much observation and knowledge as you can have of all of those different areas of theater will really help with stage managing because you are at the center of all of those departments. And you don't have to be an expert in any of it. I'm certainly not. If you were like, Katie, go hang a light in the air, I would say that might be unsafe. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but I do understand the process. the process and what those people need to accomplish what they're trying to do. Um, I would also say that in order to be successful in stage managing, you have to really want to see everyone else succeed around you. Mm. Um, it's certainly not a job for applause. You never are going to get, you know, that curtain call or that spotlight on you. And so you have to be someone who really is fulfilled by watching the people around you succeed. And, and like we were talking about, the whole job is to execute the director's vision. So it cannot be about your decision or what you think is the best choice. It has to be about holding everyone accountable to what that person's goal and idea is, um, which I love. I mean, I love – like I was talking about, you know, the understudies, like I always have sort of that like proud mom feeling of watching mm -hmm. them rise to the occasion and do a great job and exceed usually their own expectations. And I think that's what makes this job fulfilling for me. Awesome. It sounds like to be a stage manager, you have to be um, the least ego driven in a room full of big <laughs> egos. Kind of, or at um, least... You just have to 
fulfill your ego through the successful execution of living vicariously. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I li- a little bit. I certainly take a lot of pride in my work. I mean, I take a lot of pride in executing a complicated technical show, but it has to be sort of this like internal satisfaction and pride because you are in the dark, hidden away. Right. You know, it's, it's, and a lot of people don't understand what the job is and what it entails. And so you just have to enjoy that satisfaction of watching it all happen successfully and like knowing that you helped it happen. I'm with you in my role as a tech director and production manager, um, especially here at the Morton um, where shows rent us. And so we may not be personally invested, invested so to speak, yeah. in the production itself or maybe we have to establish working rapport with people very, very quickly. You know, um, I can tell very early on in the day or in the process of the production how successful it's going to be if I can have good um, communication lines established with that stage manager. Mm-hmm. Um, the shows where, like, especially, you know, sometimes in community theater where people wear more than one hat, um, and it, it's necessary sometimes where, like, I might do a show where I have a different stage manager for the second act than I do for the first act <laughs> because let's say they're swapping roles or something right. like that on the stage. It is totally understandable, but you, um, the consistency is really important. Yeah. And you really begin – stage manager to me is one of those positions where um, maybe no one else out in the audience really knows. They may see a show not going perfectly or executed perfectly – but they may not know who's responsible back there or on vice versa. They may see a show that's going perfectly and not know that mm-hmm. it's all the stage manager and how well that they're keeping people on track yeah. um, and communicating. Um, it sounds like you have to just be an absolute master communicator, psychologist. <laughs> you know, It does have a tinge of therapist about it sometimes, <laughs> just like a hint of therapy sometimes when you're, you know, just have a lot of people, a lot of people who are working really hard. And the blessing and the curse of working in the arts is that everyone chose it because they're passionate and they love it. And everyone is so invested. There's no sense of, you know, I'm going to clock out at five and go home and watch TV and not care about this until I come back in the morning. Everyone is Your soul is in it. Doing their, yeah, their soul work, their life work. And that is amazing. And it's the best part of it. But it also can mean that there's just a lot of emotional investment. And you do have to navigate making sure that everyone feels safe and comfortable and heard and like they can do their best work. And I I think the fact that I have no aspirations to be a performer – It's a very common question that stage managers and behind the scenes technicians in general get, I think, is I'll tell people and they'll sort of say, well, did you want to be an actor? Did you want to be a designer? Is it a fallback to be behind the scenes? Just because you couldn't cut it? Right, exactly. And for me, I mean, truly the answer is no, you could not pay me to be on stage doing what those actors are doing. It would terrify me. And I think that that lends me a really healthy respect for what they have to do. And if they are uncomfortable in their costume or something isn't working for them or whatever it is, I have so much empathy for the fact that they are the ones that have to walk out in front of 500 eyeballs Mm. and put their heart and soul out to be seen. And I do not have to do that. I am safely in the back in my black and my headset. Um, So that I, I think it's important to have empathy for what everyone is giving to the production. One last question to kind of close out our time. And I really appreciate you taking time to come out and talk with us. Um, If you could go back in time and give yourself one piece of advice, thinking about your younger self, that might have made your journey to become a professional stage manager a little bit smoother, what would it be and why? One piece of advice. I think it would probably be one of the biggest lessons that I've learned about communication. Um, And it would be that 
it, everything has to be over communicated because mm. people just communicate so differently and everyone has their own place that they're coming from. Like you think that you have written a sentence that is very clear and concise and informational, but when someone reads it and in the back of their mind, they're thinking about their insecurity or their frustration about something else earlier in the day, it doesn't necessarily get absorbed. Mm. And I think that that was one of the mistakes that I could make early in my career of sort of thinking, okay, this has been communicated, you know, I told you, I did it, it's done. And knowing that that's actually not enough in the real world where people are not perfect and everyone is busy and everyone, you know, whether it's their kid just threw a temper tantrum when they were dropping them off at the babysitter before they came into the theater. And so they're distracted. Whatever it is, everyone has a human life that they're dealing mm. with. And so you have to over communicate and double communicate and triple communicate and check in with people and make sure that they respond and say that they have understood it and then send it again. <laughs> well, you know, just and I kind of went through two stages where the first stage was realizing once or basic communication was not enough. And the second stage was frustration of these are adults and professionals. And why do I feel like I'm babysitting mm. or why am I putting in so much energy to communicate this information that really should be a single email or whatever the mm. specific circumstance was. And then the third stage is having done it for long enough and been on the other side of it enough where someone sent me an email and I read it and I, it got lost in my, you know, and realizing that you can't ascribe negative intentions to people maybe not doing what you would prefer that they do, but no one is coming into work thinking, oh, I hope I do a really bad job today. You know, right. everyone is, I mean, you may occasionally find someone who's not authentically invested in the process and not authentically trying to do their best, but it's very rare. Um, so I think that is the advice that I would give to my younger self is learn to exceedingly communicate mm. and understand and empathize with the need for that and don't right. feel frustrated by the fact that the people that you're working with actually do turn out to be just humans. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, there's so much semantics in our communication. I think mm -hmm. that that's a huge universal takeaway from our conversation today is, is – um, I've been accused in, in my career, too, of being that over-communicator. Mm -hmm. I actually had a boss one time in, in a particular venue, and in case he ever sees this video, I won't say his name <laughs> or where I work. Uh, but he actually pulled me to the side, and he goes, you write such um, overly communicative emails. I would love to give you this book to show you how to be a more concise communicator because I simply don't have time to read all the detail. And at first I was offended, but then it took me a while to realize that at the level that this person sat in the organization, um, it wasn't a slight against mm -hmm. me. It was just, hey, I really appreciate that you're so conscientious, but I just need you to put it in a format that I can digest it I need a little you to bit give me the headlines. Better. And um, it, it, it made me better. So being able to... Um, realized that, like you said, it's not a negative intention. It has nothing to do with mm -hmm. morality. Is this person a good person, a bad mm -hmm. person? Are they bad at remembering things? It's just we all have lives, and I think, um, outside of our jobs. And uh, this world has become so saturated with information. Absolutely. That, um, I used to feel bad about saying things over and over, and now that I've gotten to the age where I'm at and the and place in my in my career, um, now people have to repeat things to me, and um, I hope that I don't offend them by asking them to say it again. Yeah. Because now I realize in hindsight, it's like, yeah, it's not just enough to say it once or to say it in one way. I have to do the hard work to kind of bridge that gap of yeah. communication between myself and that person. 
And when it all comes together, it really is a beautiful thing. Mm -hmm. it, it is a lot of satisfaction. So, well, um, I think that we've kind of gotten to uh, the end of our time, but I just wanted to thank you for, for coming out. And again, um, from a schedule that otherwise would be packed to the brim <laughs> yeah. um, to come sit on this uh, historic stage in a place where you sort of cut your teeth in this industry. Absolutely. It's so nice to be back in this building. I said when I walked in, I was like, oh, my gosh, I haven't been in here in, you know, six, seven years, probably. Oh, it's wonderful. so nice. Well, it's glad we're glad to have you back here. I'm I'm sad that our paths did not cross before now, but I know. I'm so glad that we've had a chance to sit down and chat. I've gotten to know you really, really well, I feel like. And again, I'm walking away from this conversation with um, so much more appreciation and understanding of what a stage manager, uh, what the responsibilities that they shoulder up. I'm glad. So I'll be kind. <laughs> so thank you once again. Really appreciate you coming Absolutely. out. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. Cool. Once again, this has been the Morning Green Room. We had a chat here with Katie Chambers, professional stage manager. Thanks for tuning in. Well, follow by.